Splatoon is the type of game only Nintendo would think to make, and that's a statement I intend to mean many different things. It's a game that both suffers and benefits from not following the example set by the rest of the industry. And now that we've finally seen everything this little package has to offer, both in single player and online, I can, at last, help you come to an educated decision on whether or not that kind of design philosophy is worth your time. Is this colorful little shooter the best way to spend your summer? Let's find out. At its core, Splatoon is a third-person shooter, so right off the bat, you'd be correct in assuming that the majority of time you'll spend in it will be online. That's about as far as assumptions will get you, though. Unlike most other shooters out there, instead of controlling people, you control person-like squid creatures called Inklings. And instead of traditional guns, Inklings use a variety of ink-spreading devices like cannons, hoses, and gigantic paint rollers. This immediately makes it feel different than other games in the genre, because not only do blasts of ink not travel nearly as far or fast as traditional bullets, but you can also see the projectiles flying through the air, giving you the time time and information necessary to potentially avoid death in many more situations than usual. Ink will cover any surface it touches in your color, and Inklings have the power to morph into a squid-like form that can swim through friendly colors at blazing speeds. Inklings can even travel up walls in this way, allowing for clever maneuvering and dynamic second-to-second -second strategies that other shooters simply cannot boast. It makes the game feel extremely fast, and to aid this, Inklings also come with the ability to super jump to the location of any of their teammates, so even if you die, you don't have to waste very much time getting back into the fight at all. To help you claim territory faster, you also come equipped with sub-weapons like grenades, disruptor bombs, and landmines, as well as extremely powerful special weapons that you can only use after coloring a certain amount of terrain without dying. Not only does covering the map in your color make life easier in general, but it's also the whole point of the match. When the timer runs out, the team that's covered the largest surface area of the map's floor with their ink will take the win. This means that Splatoon's real claim to fame is that unlike every other shooter, being the best at killing other players is not necessarily the way to win. Well, I say that, but it's not like if you see an enemy player that you're not going to try and splat them, simply due to the fact that you mutually can't trust them not to target you in turn. Still, it creates some interesting mind games, as you have to judge whether chasing after a fleeing opponent is worth having to spend time not covering up territory. You have to wrap your head around how pressuring someone for control of one spot is usually less effective than ignoring them outright and helping to overrun the rest of the map. This mode is known as Turf War, and it's only a fraction of what the total package has to offer. Splatoon has regularly been getting more weapons, maps, and competitive modes added to its selection of offerings as time has gone on. This includes places like Port Mackerel and Kelp Dome, as well as a more competitive ranked battle mode, which itself is inaccessible until you hit player level 10. Because of this, Nintendo ingeniously decided to keep the entire community out of the mode until a sizable portion of people had hit level 10. This way, enough of the community would be playing the mode when it launched to make it feel worth joining in the first place, instead of being stuck in empty lobbies wishing the rest of the community would just get good already. This brings us to one of Splatoon's more controversial decisions. None of these updates need to be downloaded to your system through patches, because most of the content is already on the disc. The question is why Nintendo would do this, and is it worth being angry about? As many of us are aware, shooters live or die based on how active their online communities are and continue to be. By constantly offering that community a reason to pop back in occasionally and play around with the new toys, they ensure that the player base has stayed healthy long enough for me to make this review, and that it will stay that way well into the future. I get that the idea of being kept from something you paid for sounds like a cheat, but unlike the last infamous example that tried to pull this on players, note that you don't have to pay extra for any of it. No feeling like you've been left out, no urge to hand over more money than you think the base game is worth, and no bull. It's like a season pass that's built right into the disc, whether you pick it up used or new, and it feels awesome.
Let's talk about that extra gear though, starting with the weapons. A good number of other shooters take pride in the fact that they offer players variety. Indeed, one of their selling points is offering you the ability to customize your loadout however you like. In Splatoon, however, every main weapon comes with a predetermined sub-weapon and special weapon. You cannot customize this to your liking. It's unclear whether this was a balancing mechanic or not, that maybe they believed this way that could prevent people from all using the exact same loadout online. If this is the case, first off, it didn't work. I can't even tell you how many golden arrow sprays I've done battle with. It's to the point where I'm crafting my strategy specifically to counter them. And second, it's a fallacy anyway, because not only does this keep players from making a good weapon better, it keeps them from making a bad weapon usable. You'll simply never touch certain weapons being offered to you because you're resigned to the fact that they'll never be useful in the way you need them to be, which is a huge shame. The weapons aren't the only place that you'll just have have to deal with what you get either. There are tons of different clothing items in this game, which sounds great until you realize that all of them have abilities attached to them, and not all have the same number of them either. This means that trying to make your character look the way you want them to, again, a major selling point in practically any other game, takes a back seat simply because having four extra abilities is objectively better than only having three. And even then, there's no guarantee you'll get good abilities either. On any given piece of equipment, extra skills are locked away until you've gained enough experience to earn them, at which point, the skill is assigned randomly from all the different ones in the game. So you could get something good like Ninja Jump or Defense Up, or you could get something completely useless in most situations like Sub Weapon Throwing Distance, which might be a little easier to swallow if I could actually choose which sub weapon that was affecting in the first place. Trying to get the gear you want with the abilities you want in Splatoon is akin to trying to breed a shiny Pokemon with tournament grade EVs. It's not impossible, but the time and effort required of you to do so is absolutely ludicrous. Of course, you can also play the single player mode if you're weird like that, and I highly recommend doing so before you ever hop online, too. Not only will it get you acclimated to the basic concepts of the game and help you learn the layouts of many of the multiplayer maps, but it also features several missions that pit you against AI-controlled opponents with all of your powers, simulating battle against real people. There are also collectible scrolls scattered about these stages that give you insight into the world and characters of Splatoon, as well as unlock new weapons for purchase in the multiplayer player. Highlights include the massive boss battles, and especially the final one, stealth missions that require you to shoot and run, and stages that make you use your abilities in really creative ways, like revealing invisible floors with your ink. It also features some of the best songs in the soundtrack, which is saying something considering the entire OST is downright jammin'. Synthetic and electronic are par for the course here, with some tracks sounding like they came straight off a Pogo album. It's an eclectic mix, and a perfect complement to the summery, urban aesthetic Splatoon goes for. Splatoon also has amiibo support, but considering how only a privileged few among us are ever going to experience it anyway, I'm not going to consider the feature in my final judgment of the game. Each figure allows you to replay single-player stages with an added condition, such as a new weapon, a time limit, or limited ammo. Completing these grants you extra in-game currency to buy multiplayer gear with, and completing sets of three along with a revamped boss fight will give you exclusive gear, more lobby minigames to play, and even replicas of the single-player weapons to use online. If that's starting to sound pay-to-win to you, don't worry. They have the exact same stats and attachments as the normal gear. Which is slightly sad, considering amiibo gear only has has three abilities, so it looks like you'll never be taking it online with you anyway. It's not the big things that make this game so enjoyable, though. What really sells Splatoon are all the small touches. How you can look in on Callie and Marie in their studio and they'll wave at you. How you can play a minigame on your gamepad while waiting in a lobby for the actual match to start. How every shopkeeper has a wacky personality that makes even the act of buying new gear just a bit more fun than it has any right to be. Like most first-party Nintendo titles, Splatoon is an incredibly polished game, packed with enough little details to ensure you'll discover something new every time you revisit an area. And it's because of this attention to detail that the world feels so alive and vibrant, how everything seems to have a life of its own and a history of its own. And without spoilers, keep collecting those sunken scrolls in single player to see just how far down the rabbit hole this goes. In whole, Splatoon is way above average, but it's far from perfect. 
The very concept of its gameplay is so refreshingly different that any fan of shooters should give it a spin just out of principle. It's constantly being supported with fresh content every single week, with huge events happening regularly. And because the game features a gyro control setting for aiming, this is a console game that actually provides the mouse-like precision PC gamers have been used to for decades. Unlike PC though, Nintendo bafflingly opted out of allowing voice chat. Odd considering dozens of other games have provided players the option to mute bad eggs themselves for years now instead of making the entire experience less convenient for everyone. And don't you dare try to tell me it's a latency thing. You know what's the last game I saw that slowed down when someone used their mic? The original Halo. If your servers can't handle the live transfer of audio data in 2015, you need to have a long, hard talk with your online department. And yeah, it should go without saying by now, but if customization is a real sticking point for you, you're not gonna find it here. Not unless you have the patience of a Beyond Good and Evil fan, anyway. And besides, most of the quote new weapons are such incremental changes from their base models anyway that they feel like they should have been mods for existing weapons rather than trying to act like unique experiences in their own right. Still, if you can put up with all that, Splatoon could very well be the most fun you've had in a shooter for a good long while. Load up, go forth, and remember, 